Good evening and welcome to this very special panel event on behalf of Wellbeing Live across all of Media City. We are here to talk about mental health this evening. Uh, tonight's panel is going to focus on what it is like to be a young person in 2021 because everybody tells you that when you're a young person these are the best years of your lives but what if they're not? What if these years are dogged by insecurity, anxiety, trolling, body shaming, suicidal thoughts, and a continuous love-hate relationship with social media? Those are but a few. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking to some very special people, all of whom are very uh, passionate about raising awareness of mental health issues, and are going to be telling us what the biggest mental health concerns are for us in 2021. And now before we start, just to say quickly, sadly, uh, Livia Atwood won't be able to join us this evening. She had to rush off to the vets with her poor little pup. Uh, but don't worry, we've got two more fantastic guests for you. Uh, first up, award-winning activist, author, broadcaster, live coach, uh, Michelle Elman, who's best known for actively trying to encourage self-love and body positivity. Uh, last year, Michelle was named one of the sons of 50 most inspirational women in the UK and is recognized as one of the top 100 creatives creating change her debut book am i ugly received rave reviews and as a result michelle has amassed over 300,000 uh, 300 300,000 followers across her social media challenge i was going to say 300 followers michelle and that would not be you know very impressive so let's try and say it michelle. <laughs> yeah. uh, my second guest is ben west an inspiring mental health campaigner uh, having lost his brother to suicide three years ago ben is dedicated to change the way we view mental health in our society and at just 20 years old ben has been awarded the diana award a pride of britain award and the mental health hero award for the work he has done to raise awareness and evolve the conversation around mental health his current focus is developing the way in which universities take responsibility responsibility for the welfare of their students so welcome you guys how are we feeling this evening hello good thank you how are you i'm great how are you michelle good. yeah good excited to be here oh glad to have you i'm really interested because you've got both very sort of different takes on what is a a massive issue so let's crack on first of all uh, the statement the title of the show this evening about this being the best <clears throat> years of your life your younger years are the best years of your life how do you feel about that suggestion particularly when you think about the year that we've just had I think I got I always got told the best years of your life was university and that was all well and good in freshers and second year but I had a nightmare year in third year and just hearing that statement in the back of your head I, I just don't think it's a helpful phrase for anyone because people go through different phases of life and what is the best like hopefully there's always the best to come and so you've never got your best in the past but when you are going through a tough mental health time especially in my third year where I had always wanted to be a psychologist my entire life since I was 11 years old and then three months before graduation I didn't want to be a psychologist anymore I finally didn't know what I wanted to do for the first time in 10 years and also got a diagnosis of PTSD on top of that and I was like oh okay great crash <laughs> down right before I graduate perfect timing um but it's this idea that life is like these series of steps and we always know the step, next step and then graduating being like what now like what do I do and not having any of the answers but then feeling like everyone else was sorted all my friends were straight onto graduate schemes and I was kind of just lost and you know what the solution to it was taking all the pressure off and I just said like I told everyone else I was going on a gap year I had no intention of going on a gap year I just wanted everyone to get off my back um and it was in that that I found what I loved because I literally took all the pressure off and started going on courses just based on what would interest me and that's how I fell into life coaching so 20s is definitely the decade of transformation and discovering yourself and changing what you want every like year or so yeah and then I think you, that's something you must agree with I know it's something you've spoken quite quite a lot about yeah well it just gives you this expectation like you're going you have to enjoy it and and so I know people and, and I can speak from experience here you go to university you leave school and everyone's like oh it's gonna be amazing it's gonna be so so good the best years of your life 
And then what that does is it gives you an expectation of it being good. So as soon as anything goes wrong, you're like, instead of thinking, oh, that's just natural, things go wrong, you start questioning yourself and you go, what have I done wrong? Why am I not being able to do this? Why am I not having the best time? Why is everyone else having a good time and I'm not? And you start to almost look at yourself as being at fault. When actually, life is such a highlight reel. The way we view other people's lives is always a highlight reel. I think that's that's made even worse by social media. And so when people tell people that you're going to have to have the best time of your life at university and you go there and it's not, immediately you start to question, why am I not good enough? Why can't I make friends? Why can't I have a good time? Why is this all happening to me? Why am I the problem here? Whereas actually we all know now, and I certainly do, I learned this quite quickly, that actually it wasn't me that wasn't right. It was the environment that I put myself in that wasn't right for me. Um, and I think that was a really big learning curve for me. And it was this, it was definitely made difficult realizing that because for my whole life I was taught this is the way that your life works. This is the plan you've got to do. This is the best year of your life. This is going to how. This is how this one's going to happen. And actually, from ninety percent of people, it doesn't turn out that way. Um, but it is so bad that we're teaching people that this is the year to have fun. This is the year that you're going to enjoy. When actually, who knows whether it's going to you're going to enjoy it. Um, but it's certainly not your fault if you don't enjoy it. You're just not at the best time of your life yet. And it has. It is one of those things that is fed to you from sort of a very early age isn't it that when you hit your teenage years it's gonna be wicked you're gonna have all these friends you're gonna start going out partying then you get your exams and then you get to university and then there's gonna be a 30k job waiting for you afterwards and it it just isn't that at all is it and you know what that pressure never really disappears because I'm a bit older than Ben I'm not sure how old Lauren is but I'm 27. Oh I'm old. (laughs) so I'm 27 and it doesn't leave so I never Mm. I mean I dated enough in uni but I went through my like what I call my crazy dating crazy dating phase in 2019 when I was like 25 and one of the things I kept saying was I should have been doing this in uni why didn't I do this in uni this was the age you were meant to be doing this and I'm 25 all my friends are in long-term relationships and I was finally in the place in my life with the confidence that I had at a much older age finally feeling confident to date and go on like and enjoy my single life and there was almost this shame around the fact that I wasn't I didn't feel mature enough. I didn't feel ready enough. I definitely wasn't confident enough or secure enough in my body to do that at uni. And I was like, well, where's this pressure coming from? And it actually forced me at 25 to like unpick all of it being like, why do I feel weird doing this now? And I wasn't that person who was like sleeping around with everyone in uni because I just was, didn't, was, wasn't in that place with my own body yet. And for people who don't know, like I've had a lot of surgery scars And I was still going through all of that stuff. And so I had these body image issues that no one could relate to at the time. Most young people don't go through the extent of surgeries I went through, let alone older people don't go through 15 surgeries either. But it was this unrelatable issue. And it took me so many years to open up and talk about it. And then eventually the PTSD forced me to. And it was only after all of that, I rebuilt my confidence, rebuilt my life, that I was like, I'm ready to date now. And yes, it's many years after my friends, but my order of life was different to everyone else or the supposed order of life in your head. That's exactly, I think that's exactly it. We put these markers, don't we, mm. throughout our lives about which ones we're supposed to hit and when, and it, it just doesn't necessarily work out like that, especially, Ben, after the last year that we've had during a yeah. pandemic. I feel like that has knocked a <clears throat> lot out of sync, hasn't it? I oh, know. Imagine going to uni being like, oh, best year of my life. And then suddenly you're, you're stuck in a, a five metre by four metre flat on your own. No friends. It's, it's awful. And actually the, what we've seen at universities and, and like you, how uh, you introduced me, I'm doing a lot of work around sort of universities duty to provide care to their students. And we have unfortunately seen so many students have been failed in, in this. You know, students that have gone to university thinking that university is the most important thing they can possibly do or that is the be all end all when it really isn't. And they've gone there assuming that they're going to get a great time and going to be able to go clubbing and have fun. I've no, I've heard from so many people that have gone to university. They've been stuck in a flat, isolating on their own. They've they've faced huge amounts of loneliness. They haven't met friends. The people they live with, they don't really like. And that they've had to drop out. Mm-hmm. Uh, what does that do to you? And like I said at the beginning, this idea that, that you, we're telling people that this is going to be the best years of their life. Imagine what 
is going through your mind when you're stuck in a tiny little flat, having food pushed through your door because you're isolating, having no friends, being in a city you don't know anything about, in a you know away from home for the first time, and then not enjoying it when your whole life you've been told you need to enjoy this. And you're, you're not going to, privilege as well. <laughs> yeah, and you're not going. You're not going to blame the situation. You're not going to blame COVID. You're not going to blame this. You're going to start blaming yourself. You're going to be like, why can't I be better? Why can't I do this better? And I've seen so many people use very dangerous narratives with themselves in this situation, where they've wondered why they haven't been able to to have the best years of their life. And I think that's really, really sad. Um, but I do think, like we said at the beginning, I think universities should be doing far, far, far more than they have been doing this year to actually protect their students and deliver on their duty of care. Because they do have a legal responsibility to look after their students. And unfortunately, this year, we're not just talking about students that are unhappy, we're talking about students that have died um, as a result of that neglect. I, I didn't actually there know there is a whole sorry sorry Michelle carry on sorry no I didn't actually know that's that's the main thing you campaign on and when you were introduced I was like I don't think I've ever spoken about this but in my second year I went into hospital for six weeks and the week I came back to uni missing six weeks of uni they asked me to hand in all my deadlines in one week that I missed and the whole time I was in hospital they were like don't worry about it don't worry about it get just get better I couldn't even walk into uni to hand Mm. in those deadlines because I was still recovering. And then it was like exams, I think two months later, no support around it. And again, this is like six years ago and I kind of had hoped things had changed. But my friend had had her mum pass away one week before exams. And both of us were in this situation. Like we, like mine was physical health and hers was obviously grief. And neither of us had support and we both got a 2-2 by 2% and we're told if you get a 2-2 by 2%, you'd be bumped up and neither of us were. And I just remember like, she was like, I'm sitting by my mum's like hospital bed, trying to choose between like being with my mum and passing my degree and this shouldn't be a choice. And there was just no compassion around it and no understanding. And I just thought, regardless of what the issue was, was whether it was physical health or um, grief, like where was the the leniency? Where was the compassion? Where was the care for our mental health? Yeah. Did they offer you, did they offer you support or reach no, out and to I, you And no, no extra time, no extra, like, really? do you know what I mean? You would think if, if it was six weeks worth of deadlines, I would have been given six weeks to hand it in, not the moment I came back to uni and the thing is with this as well sorry this isn't this isn't just this isn't just about morals and this isn't just about whether it's right or wrong that they did that that's that's they have a legal requirement that's a legal duty of care so what they've done there is actually against the law because they have a duty of care to protect students um health safety and well-being and to ignore that to know that one of your students has gone to hospital and then to not reach out for support that's not just where something they should do out of goodwill that's something they need to do by law and unfortunately too many universities are absolutely neglecting that that duty of care which is something i'm campaigning on at the moment it's absolutely terrible and you say things haven't changed i got a, a, a dm the other day from someone um who said that she's going through a transition to become transgender. She's got body dysmorphia. Um, She was self-harming and suicidal. And she went to the university support department that offers counselling. And they told her to make a cup of, make a hot chocolate and run a bath and she'd feel better. And I just think it's so blatantly obvious that universities are absolutely denying um, that they have a responsibility to provide any sort of care at all. Um, and it's not just me that's saying this. Um, Lord Ralph Lucas in the House of Parliament has just launched, uh, just lodged a bill um, claiming that universities have, have failed their duty of care towards students. And it's awful. And like I said, unfortunately, students are dying because of this. We've had so many it's students. Exactly those what you said about you internalise it, because I actually remember, sorry, Laura, we're just I'm going on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like, it's exactly what you said. Yeah. I internalised it, thought I was so stupid because I got a 2-2 in my second year when one of my friends, mm. none of my friends did, to the point where when I got diagnosed with PTSD in third year, I didn't even tell my uni because I was like, what's the point? They're not going to, they're not going to, and this is again, two months before my dissertation's due, two months before my final exams. I didn't tell them because I was like, well, you're not going to do anything anyway. You didn't do anything for physical health. Why would you do anything for mental health? Well, I think it's quite interesting about what you're saying is that these are obviously experiences that lots of people have had, 
But as we've seen, and as is the landscape with mental health issues, is that people haven't felt like they can come forward. That's the kind of thing. Everyone has felt that kind of shame of like, well, I'm supposed to be at university. It's supposed to be a great time. I'm not supposed to say, you know, that I haven't felt supported or that I'm missing home or that I'm struggling with living alone. Do you think there is a sea of change at the moment? Or do you think we're still in, in a bit of a stilted place when it comes to kind of opening up and talking about mental health as a young person? I think there's there's two there's two real areas when you talk about the sort of progress we're making around mental health. There's the there's the area around talking about mental health in a sort of casual way where I think we are making a huge amount of progress in that panels like this are taking forward. There's a lot of people like myself and Michelle online talking about mental health. It's becoming so much more talked about. I mean, it's on TV all the time. You can't watch TV without it popping up somewhere telling you to have a cup of tea with your mates, right? It's, so I think in that sense, we are having more of a conversation and the words mental health are getting into more conversations casually. However, I still think there is a pretty conversation about mental health awareness and there is an ugly conversation I think the pretty conversation is happening. I don't think we're having the ugly conversation still. I mm -hmm. think too many people are still not able to talk about what's going on in more in, in deeper capacity than just mental health in itself. Um, and and I still, right, can you tell yeah. us a little bit about sort of how you got into it? Because obviously you've got a very direct and very personal reason for doing what it is you do. Are you okay to talk about that? Yeah, of course. So, um, I mean, go back for four years, I didn't know what mental health was. I mean, the fact that it, it, if you went back and told me I'd sitting on a panel talking about mental health for the media city, I'd be like, you know, what, what on earth am I doing there? Um, I had no idea what mental health was. And uh, in September 2017, my younger brother was diagnosed with depression. And my mum told me I was sitting in the kitchen. She came over and was like, you know, just want to tell you that Sam's been diagnosed with clinical depression. And to be honest with you, I kind of sat down and I was like, what does that mean? You know, I didn't know what that meant. How can you be sad? How can you have depression? It just went in one ear, out the other. I was like, put on some music, go out, play football with your mates, get over it sort of thing. Um, and then in January 2018, he took his own life and died. And that hit me so hard and shocked me so much because I didn't even know this was something someone could suffer with, let alone die from. And I, you know, all the emotions you feel through grief were just exaggerated. The guilt, I'm his older brother. Why, why was I so naive to this, you know? And very, very quickly after Sam died, so many of my friends started, started telling their own stories to me. And like, out of out of so many people two of my mates really stuck with me like these are people I'd known most of my life um they were really close friends and they both told me they'd attempted suicide before and had never told anyone and I just remember sitting back and being like I feel like I've failed as a friend have if because you haven't felt comfortable to having that conversation and I started doing some research into it and started realizing that I really wanted to campaign in, in mental health awareness get people talking because I just saw that almost everyone I knew had something going on beneath the surface that I was the only person they were talking to about. And I just remember thinking, that's so sad. And I want to do something to help those people open up and help those people get support. Um, and so, yeah, I started doing that and it's kind of snowboarded and hasn't let me out. <laughs> it feels like you've done such a lot as well. It's not really been that long, especially the last year has mm. really flown by, hasn't it? And it is quite amazing what you've sort of taken on and, and created and are now opening up and encouraging others to do the same. And I think it is that thing, isn't it, of once you do start talking about it, you realise the sheer oh, amount it's of awful. people. It's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Um, Michelle, sort of what's your experiences coming out of, of the last year, would you say? Obviously, I think this pandemic has really affected people in ways that we're probably still not able to see as yet, aren't we? Yeah, so how I've been referring to it is I think we are going through a global trauma and the definition within life coaching, and I'm not going to broaden this to traditional psychology, but within life coaching, a trauma is anything that you can't escape. And this is a situation we can't escape. And so what's going to happen when what happens with any trauma, similar to the fact that I had PTSD 10 years after the surgeries that I had, we are all going to have that response at a different pace and so you might feel that as soon as the world starts opening up but you might also feel that in a year at which point you're going to feel this thing of 
but it was a year ago. Why am I feeling this now? It's because it's not, not, not logical and not rational. And I think one of the things that the pandemic has done is it's forced us all to sit like and actually feel what we're feeling so a lot of what the world creates is to numb us out and keep us busy and so when you're busy you're not thinking you're not feeling and we've now just had a year and a half of thinking and feeling and so there have been a lot of these almost mirroring what Ben said where there have been a lot of these feel your feeling it's okay to not be okay conversation I think the other side for me as a life coach that I'm not seeing is Okay, so everyone's using the word abuse, toxic, narcissist, gaslighting. Do you actually know what that means? Or are we labeling everything as that? Because there's no education element. There's no, people want to say feel your feelings, but no one's telling you how to feel your feelings. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I I sometimes get a bit frustrated. Look, like when I hear these conversations online, because I'm sitting there going, but how, and I'm a life coach, but how, like, can you please include the, but how, like, I do, I really agree with you there, and especially with the phrase, it's okay not to be okay, that became yeah. a real sort of slogan, didn't it, last year, and I go, I see the kind of good nature, the goodwill behind that phrase, but I go, but it's actually not okay, to yeah. not, do you know what I mean, like, we shouldn't accept that that's the norm, that everybody around you feels quiet about feeling depressed that's not okay is it the, the thing I was trying to combat the most is this idea it's okay to have a bad day I don't have bad days I have bad months like I my life is either three good months three bad months and so like when I'm online and people are like it's really cute I have like a Q&A every week and like someone every week will ask you how are you and I'm like it's really sweet you guys always ask me this but if I'm saying four weeks in a row I'm fine I'm just crying every day like it's not that like I haven't had joy in those three months it's because I let myself cry and like and I, I try to show this to my audience that like I go through and if they follow me for more than a year, they see these things and I don't label it as any any uh, mental illness. I don't I'm not empowered by labels myself. If you are for you use labels. But for me, I'm just like this has always been the balance of my life. But over five years of therapy, I have lowered my lows and I've lowered my highs as well so that it's a more it's less of a roller coaster, but I ride it out and but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And so there are months where I've cried every day. But if you saw me giving a talk, you'd have no clue. I'm currently in a really good phase, but like I can give a talk and then, or I can even do a full work day from nine till six. And then the moment it hits six, I'm crying in my bedroom. Doesn't mean I'm not going to be up at nine o'clock tomorrow and doing my job. It means that I give myself the time. And whilst I guess the traditional view of mentally healthy is not that, that is me at my most mentally healthy, is that I give myself permission in the evenings to cry, to let it out, to feel everything so that I can be okay at nine o'clock. It's not that, it's not that one contradicts the other, it's that both work well together and that the times when I've, I was at my worst with PTSD or any of these things were the times when I didn't give myself permission to be that. And I think it's really confusing to people to hear because they're like, but you're a life coach. And I was like, yeah. And if you saw me in a session, you'd have no clue what's going on in my mental health life because that's my job. Like I switch it off. I'm there for you 100% in our session. And then the moment we end this session, I go back to being human. And that doesn't make me better or worse at my job. It just two facts can exist. Mm -hmm. And you've obviously got, a, a, you know, a real fantastic insight into it because this has been what you do for years but the average person, particularly young men, Ben, they, they don't understand any of that. They can't even think about allowing that space for them to be sad. They just shut it straight down, don't they? And we're seeing suicides go up, particularly in young men. Mm. Yeah, I, I love what you just said about this idea that actually the mentally healthy person is not the one that doesn't show emotion. It's actually the one that does. And for a long time, men have been taught that you're healthy or you're strong if you don't show emotion. You're right. The, the opposite is true. You know, I always love this, um, this express, the, the expression, um, express your emotions. Right. And we're, we're always told to express our emotions. And as a man growing up, that was seen as such a 
negative weak thing to do right if i was to walk into you know back in the day if i was to walk into a classroom in tears i would have been labeled as the weak the weak one right and i think men are taught that stoicism is attractive and that's a really good trait and that's going to make you a man right but actually i learned something just not, not even that long ago quite recently i just th- i just started thinking about what that that phrase means expressing your emotion and really fundamentally expressing your emotion is this big fella inside your head the brain tells you to feel a certain way and you feel it yeah and actually that's pretty logical right <laughs> you know if, if the brain tells you to feel a certain way you just feel that way okay so if you're feeling sad if your brain wants you to be sad it's telling you to be sad so be sad cry if your brain tells you to be angry be angry find a safe way of being angry you know, go and kick a ball hard, go and scream into a pillow, be angry. Right. And I think so many men are taught, like you said, like the, the, the not expressing emotions and not crying and not doing all this and not, you know, coming across as emotional makes you mentally healthy or appear mentally healthy. I can absolutely tell you that the opposite is true. The person that expresses their emotions is the mentally healthy one of the two of you um, for the for the most part, because they understand why their brain is telling them to be sad um so i think that we've got to step away we absolutely have to step away from this idea that expressing emotion is a bad thing the analogy i use is like if you were thirsty would you tell yourself you're not thirsty and you wouldn't go but i had a glass of water an hour ago so why am i still thirsty it doesn't matter you're still thirsty Mm. so like when when you've finished crying for like three hours you're like okay great I should be done now. No, you know, you're still sad. And some of the things I'm crying about are from like when I was 11 years old and like, but I went through a lot of medical trauma. Like it's understandable. Yeah. And I think the other thing is that when, so as a stereotype, men aren't allowed to feel their sadness and women aren't allowed to feel their anger. And also if a man were to kick a, kick a ball at a wall and a woman was in, his presence, you would get scared of that man because you're like, you can't control your anger. Anger is not meant to be controlled. Mm. As long as you don't express it at a person, and that includes yourself, that actually is a healthy way to express your anger. So as much as societally, we find like a man going to a boxing class societally acceptable. It's also, it's also a healthy way to express anger. If a man wanted to punch a pillow and like, yeah. Or even scream in the solitude of his own house. That's an acceptable way, acceptable way to feel anger. But in the same way, if a woman bursts out crying, it doesn't mean that she's being irrational or too emotional. It's her letting it out and do it in the safety of your own home. Like sometimes if I'm angry, I put on like Avril Lavigne and shout along to Avril Lavigne. <laughs> like I have no clue what the build is outside my 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 yeah. apartment think I'm doing, but like I like to think the music is loud enough they can't hear me screaming. But like I'm not screaming at anyone. And the problem is, if you don't feel that anger, what happens is road rage, or you start yelling at the waiter for no reason because it's not that it disappears, it gets displaced or it gets displaced to the wrong person. So you might be angry with your boyfriend, but then you start yelling at your mum, and it's not, ang- it's not aimed at the right person, but you actually, you would not yell at anyone if you just screamed alone in your own apartment and then went to go have the conversation. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things I found really difficult during lockdown, obviously we all kind of do jobs, which means you, you go in here, you go in there, you keep busy. And it's exactly what Michelle was saying earlier. We now have had this time to sit and feel those things. And it made me realize I am not good at sitting still and thinking about that I'm feeling sad or feeling angry. And there's been a lot of that. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot more people talk about it because you, people are just going to have to. You have to talk about it because if not, like terrible, terrible things are going to happen. Mm-hmm. So I think that's probably going to be one of the next sort of hurdles that we possibly face is how can we encourage people to sit in their sadness and sit in their anger and be comfortable and be like, this is just a, a human emotion that we, we have to feel. I think we're still in the phase of a quick fix that people are like, but you can't, you can't just sit there and cry. And I'm like, actually you can. And like, I, I teach people a lot when I say feel your feelings, what I personally mean is you almost do a whole body scan and you go, okay, where's anger sitting in my body? Okay. It's in my heart. 
okay, as you start crying, what you might find is the anger moves, like, because sometimes you cry because you're angry. It's not always like logical or whatever. Um, but if you feel angry in your heart and you want to cry it out, you start crying, you might find it moves down to your stomach. So then you follow that emotion and you stay with it. And what you'll find, and this is the reason why we don't feel our feelings, is as soon as you put your focus or your attention on it, it gets worse. And that's the thing you're avoiding. But if you stay with it long enough, it starts, I like almost see it as like a stress ball. It's like, it will tense up first and then it will start like relaxing. And that's actually how to feel your emotions. And then, so I get all these DMs being like, but I sat with it, I sat with it for 20 minutes and it just didn't disappear. And I was like, okay, and how many years have you been sitting with that, that feeling that you've never felt and you suddenly think it's gonna disappear in 20 minutes? It's the first time you've ever felt your feelings in like, let's say it's a 25 year old in 25 years and you've finally given it 20 minutes, try giving it 25 years and then check in with me. But like, obviously then we have new things creating new emotions every day. So it's almost like adding more shit onto the plate to deal with. And that's the human experience. Sorry to break it to you, but that's life. And, and also I think, I mean, playing into that, let's talk about social media because social media oh, would very much encourage you that maybe you are allowed to be sad for a day, but then tomorrow you're back up on the horse and you yeah, carry on. How, Michelle, so you, you, you're very engaging with your, with your followers and everyone online. What, what is social media doing? Is it, is it completely messing us up? You know what? In the last week, I have had so many conversations with people with big followings, like I'm talking like 100,000 upwards of, is it possible to have social med media and still have good health? good mental health specifically, because you, I'm not sure as humans, we are designed to be um, on the receiving end of that many opinions. And I think the way it changes your brain is that you can't form an opinion without knowing everyone else's opinion, number one. Number two, you can't live a day without thinking about what every other option you had that day was. So whether you're an influencer or not, like for me as an influencer, I say no to a photo shoot and then I go through my stories and I see all the people who are on the photo shoot and I go, oh, but I said yes to the talk, but I said no to the photo shoot. But uh, now I know I can live both of them. Actually, that's not true because I don't know how shit it was to actually be there. I just saw the really happy clips of it. When, it, when you're not an influencer, when you're a young person who's on Instagram, it's the same thing. You've declined a party because you want to spend an evening with your family, but now you can see the party. But every time I've said no to something because I genuinely didn't want to go or anything like that, I, and I've actually checked in with my friends at, and not just watched the Instagram stories. They've gone, oh, it wasn't that great. You didn't miss much. But exactly. online, it looked a lot of fun. And so I, I do these digital detoxes every year. I usually do it around Christmas. It's usually about two to three weeks. And I do think it needs to be two to three weeks for you to really see the notice, like noticeable impact social media has on your mental health. And I must say the difference when I don't have social media is my mind is cleaner. I live uh, clearer. <laughs> I live more in the moment. And I don't compare myself. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't even think it's something natural in me to do until social media is back on my phone. The comparison for me is, is, is the big one. I don't think there's anybody out there that doesn't struggle with the comparison element of it. How do you find it, Ben? Are you, are you a prolific user of, of social media? I've definitely struggled to find the balance. I can't lie. I think it's very, I mean, to be totally honest, I don't think I've got the balance right at the moment. You know, I think it's, it's very telling when the first thing you do in the morning is go on Instagram, scroll on Instagram, go on Facebook. And to be honest, I'm very aware of that because social media is in essence quite fake you know whatever you do with your social media at the end of the day it's very very small part I mean it's a frame of your day uh, that you get to choose to put up there and I think just just from my experience and conversations I've had I know Sam my brother really really struggled at school looking at social media because he was comparing his very very dark life with everyone else's highlight reel and so he was going on Instagram and he was seeing, oh, that looked great, that party. I wish I'd, I wish I'd gone. Or, you know, someone doing really well in their exams or, or, you know, getting a job. I've got that at the moment. Where everyone's like posting, hey, I've got a job. It's going so well for me. And you look at that and then you see what that person is presenting is their life. And you look at your own life. And if you're in a dark place, you go, 
like like I mean like the theme of this like we were talking about before this idea that you have got the best the best years of your life you wonder what you're doing wrong um and I think social media and I've definitely found this you start looking at your own life being like oh why can't I do that why can't I do this better why why am I not like that and so I definitely think it's it's quite it's quite a toxic environment I think as well if you look at social media in younger years in sort of early teens um and mid teens it it's so bizarre that it becomes a competition I, I just don't understand that at all and I was I was like that I mean I, I think I got like 100 likes on a photo back in like 2018 or something and I was like yay and I'm, I think back to that and I'm like why did I celebrate why did I feel the why need to celebrate, celebrate that mm-hmm. yeah it's weird, but what? we all do it don't we yeah but at that point I mean it's not like it's a growth thing it's not a tool for business it's nothing that's actually achieved I haven't achieved anything why did I feel like that was a success and you go to school and it is it's like who's got the biggest following if you look at all your mates back at school you had to have a following that was higher than your followers and we're talking like a thousand followers this is not your this is not your business it's not your life why does that matter to you and I think it's really difficult it's become almost a popularity contest on social media where the numbers are king and I think it's teaching people a very damaging thing um and it is quite damaging I said I'm a bit older than you guys and and, you know we didn't we we just didn't have it you know the the first thing that came around was sort of MySpace that was when we were sort of 15 16 and then it was a a case that social media was just to kind of connect with people that's what it was for Mm. And I look back on those days and I think, wow, that was amazing. I miss now, those days. I never got those days. <laughs> yeah, I know. Unfortunately. I, know. I mean, I got, young. <laughs> I, know. I got Facebook at 15. And when you were talking about the likes on Instagram, the thing in my school was if your profile picture didn't get enough likes, you removed your profile picture mm. and you put another one up. But I remember the, the age of Facebook and I actually think it was social media at its best when it was just so it, I could talk to my friends for the first time from Hong Kong I lived in Hong Kong and my friends were in school and even in the first few years of uni Instagram didn't exist so it was just Facebook we would upload these photo albums online so now I have access to all my uni pictures because of that but it wasn't a curated thing it would be a photo dump it would be like the photo of the floor the photo of like a blurry like which yeah. showed the whole night but even that I remember like someone from school being like oh Michelle suddenly got really popular and the only reason they thought I'd become popular was because all my friends took out a digital camera to the club so I was being tagged in like <laughs> joking like 200 photos a day and they thought I was popular it was the same night out it was just multiple people but it was things like that where you Anytime you are making yourself feel bad by comparing yourself, you're actually ripping out that accomplishment out of the context. So the thing that I've been, an example from my own life is like the number of people who were like, oh, I want to write a book one day when I got my book, my second book deal. Um, and like, oh, like you're so lucky. It's because you have a big following, blah, blah, blah. I got four rejections. Like there's a reason why my first book came out in 2018 and uh, my second book came out in 2021. In between were four full manuscripts that were rejected. And like, you don't see that because like I was talking about it, but like, obviously I only really wanted to share it once there was good news. And, but you look at that snapshot, you look at the final result and you go, oh, well, it's easy for you. And it's like, actually, it wasn't easy for me. There were days I was crying because I got rejected so many times. But you do that with someone getting a new job or you do that because someone has got a certain number of followers that you've not got. And what you have to do in order to make yourself feel bad is rip it out of context completely. And not only does it make yourself feel worse, but actually it's really hard to celebrate the other person because you don't have the full context of like what they went through, which you would normally have if a friend was talking to you about it and actually telling you that accomplishment in person. I think the thing that gets me really is that, you know, and really we make a choice to be on it. We do it because it kind of goes hand in hand for what we do as a job. We do have a choice to kind of walk away from it. But it really saddens me when you hear about, you know, people like Sam who... There was no, there was no gain. There was nothing there that meant he had to be on it. It was just the pull of it had drawn him in, and that constant comparison for for a kid who's in 
school it is it's just it's just horrific and you know you know there's probably millions of kids up and down the country that feel the same way yeah definitely I mean no no 13 year old should feel that they have to post a photo of them looking a certain way to be in school and I just think there's so much pressure now on social media in schools to sort of act like your typical influencer post bikini photos post topless photos post photos of you doing certain things eating lovely food and just pick point it's almost become like you have to paint this perfect picture and that's so damaging because there's no perfect no one has the perfect life no one's got it perfect no one has that and also what he would want that I wouldn't want that I didn't want my every single day to be perfect I don't want to wake up with a kale smoothie and then go out for a for you know get get a fake tan and then you know do that that's that's not what I consider perfect at all I want the bad days um so that I can feel good about that like um like Michelle said I want the rejection I know we want the rejection because then when you actually achieve something it's huge and if you paint your life as this perfect life when you achieve something it's like just another perfect day um mm-hmm. so I, I definitely think social media is bad but I also think social media can be very very good because well, that interestingly brings me on to a question that we've had in yeah. from Craig who says you know in 2021 if there was no social media in the world mm. do you think the world would be a happier place oh this is such a difficult question isn't it because there are lots of benefits to social media isn't it like Michelle was saying the ability to connect worldwide is 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 in, in amazing yeah but also like I my family's been in Hong Kong like I I've been able to connect to people that I mean I remember when I was in hospital in second year and we only had Facebook and we had no FaceTime I didn't see my friends until I came out of hospital because I couldn't call them. I couldn't do any of that stuff. So I do think technology is important. I also believe I would not have a platform if it was down to traditional media. Like I am fat, scarred, mixed race. Like you don't see people like me in traditional media. Now they have to listen to me because in, in effect, people choosing to follow me has meant that they're like, oh, she has something to say, but only because people followed me. Whereas... I think there's something beautiful about the fact that all voices on social media are kind of equal, no matter how big or small your following is. I came from an account that had, when I posted that bikini picture, I think I had 400 followers and I went viral in 2015 and it's now my job and has been for six years. Like it, it's wild. The fact that I essentially wasn't nobody, which I don't think anyone's a nobody, but like it was me talking about my personal experience of me going through surgery scars and having surgeries and it resonating enough that it was almost like the people decided that this was an important enough conversation. I just happened to be the person who started it. But now I think there's been change as a result. Like, I don't think people have the same response when you show a scar on social media anymore they don't go at the time in 2015 it would have been ew gross I, I'm really sorry you had to go through that but why do you have to talk about it I'm sorry you had to go through that but why do you have to show it I don't get that response anymore so something's changed and I don't think this um press for inclusivity this press for diversity would have changed because the the tagline from the media was oh, but being mixed race doesn't sell. Oh, but no one wants to see a a front cover with a fat woman on the magazine. Actually, they do. That's why we have followings. That's why body positivity became a bigger conversation. And so it, it has done such positive things. And even just like educated people on topics that wouldn't have directly affected them, they wouldn't have had the life experiences that they had to, or that friendship group to have these conversations you can now find that community online so it's not all negative it's learning how to boundary it and have a good relationship with it is that kind I of agree. how you feel Ben? yeah I think I don't think it's a case of whether we have social media or don't have social media I think it's definitely a case of how we use it I've got a, a rule of everyone I follow um, they have to tick one of three boxes um, they have to either inspire me educate me or entertain me and if they're not one of those three I don't want anything to do with them and I've been very very strict with that because social media has become a bit of my it's my job it's my life okay from the moment I wake up it's either my free time my casual time with my mates or it's my job and there's so I spend a lot of time on there and I've been very strict myself that I've got to keep that safe nice space and the one thing I can control is what I see 
I can't control what people are saying to me, but I can control what people are, what I see. So I've been very strict that I only follow people that educate me, inspire me or entertain me. So I have a laugh. I learn something and I feel good about myself. And it's not one of those things. I'm sorry. They don't get to come into my life because that's one thing we can control with social media. It's who affects you. And we do have control over that. Um, so I think what we need to do is not necessarily stop having social media, but actually start controlling uh, or, or changing people's way of using it. Um, and without, you know, you know, I know I respect that this is how some people use social media, um, but I think certain ways of presenting on social media um, is not just immoral, but actually quite dangerous. Um, and it's still going on now. A lot of fitness influencers are pushing very dangerous messages, um, maybe without realizing. I think we need far more regulation as to what's going on with social media. And I think social media companies need to take far more responsibility for actually making their platforms safe. Because at the moment, they're not safe. They're mm -hmm. not safe at all. Um, so I think those two things, we need to educate people how to use this tool. And this is what I like to think of it as, as well. Educate, social media is a tool. It's not a, it's not a life. It's not your online life. It's a tool. Um, so we need to teach people how to use this tool correctly. And I do think we have to regulate this better and we have to get social media companies to actually take more account of making their platforms and their, and their apps and whatever safe for people to use because too many people are falling through gaps and actually coming into a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. I fully agree with that. Um, we're coming towards the end. So the one thing I'd like to just focus on now, we've sort of touched on all of the sort of different things that can affect a young person in 2021. I mean, I say touch, we could probably talk for hours about all the yeah. different <laughs> sort of things that do affect people. Um, but the one thing I think there'll be a lot of people out here watching would like to know is what physically can be done. It's like Michelle was saying earlier, you know, it's all well and good people like us coming on and going yes we talk about mental health but what people really often want to know if you've switched onto this live stream is you want to learn something you want to take something away what do you think you can do to help somebody who might be struggling or what can you do to help yourself if you you know if you are struggling what would be your kind of advice Ben to kick things off Oh, wow. That's a huge question. OK, there's loads that we can be doing. I mean, if you talk from my story, you know, I think when I started talking about mental health, when I started pushing for change, pushing for policy change, I was 18. I was still in school. Um, and so many people are so scared of standing up for something because they don't think they're going to be listened to. I'm here. I'm sitting here, aren't I? I started because I just saw something was going on. I started saying that's not right. We need to do something. I started this by by starting a petition online to make mental health first aid part of teacher training because I saw that and was like, that's not right. How can teachers not be trained in mental health during their teacher training? Um, I did that. I was 18 years old. I didn't think anyone was going to listen to me, but I was shocked at how many people did. Um, so the first thing is, if you want to create change, you've got to actually go and start that and have that conversation. And, and everyone can, regardless of your age. Um, in terms of getting people to talk about mental health, because that is really, really important that we have those conversations. I've got another another little phrase. I'm all about phrases. Yes, me. please. Uh, we like them. Yeah, we do love a phrase. So it's cup of tea, one, two, three. Okay. So I don't actually have, I've got a bottle of Coke. We'll pretend it's a cup of tea, right? So cup of tea, one, two, three. If you want to talk about your mental health or if you want to get someone you know to talk about their mental health, a good trick I use is cup of tea, one, two, three. Make a brew. <laughs> um, get, a, get a cup of tea or get a kettle on. Invite someone over for a cup of tea. It's much easier now that COVID's you know, coming to an end. Get someone over for a cup of tea. Having something in your hand to hold and a cup of tea makes you relax. It relaxes you. Um, it does. It, it just gives you something to do while you're talking. Then you need to count to three and just say it. If you want to open up about your mental health, you've got something on your mind. One, two, three, rip the plaster off. I'm not doing very well, mate. Can we talk about it? Or something's going on. I really need to talk about it. Let's just, can we have a word? It, once you get that initial conversation out, that first sentence where I'm not okay, the ball starts rolling. And the same works if you want to get someone to talk. One, two, three. I've noticed you're really down, mate. Let's talk. What's going on? And so many times you have that initial one, two, three moment and it all just comes out and it all just happens. And it just gives people that permission to talk or it gives you that ability to just have that first thing. So cup of tea, one, two, three. Um, that's a good, the good, uh, good one. But I think also, you know, I couldn't have done any of what I've done. I, you know, I'm, I'm calling for policy change. I'm working with government. I'm, I'm doing all this stuff. I couldn't have that platform if people didn't support me and sign my petitions and share my stuff. And so actually, if you really want to help in the grand scheme of things, 
signing petitions, sharing stuff, engaging with people that are doing a good job on social media. Um, not, you know, not a bit of self-promotion, but come on, like follow people like me, you know, follow people like us that are calling for that change because that gives us our voice. On my own, I'm a 21-year-old kid, really. I don't have much of an influence. But with social media, with people behind me, you know, I can I can tell the prime minister he's doing a bad job, and I have. <laughs> yes, we <get> it. <laughs> we love that, <laughs> Michelle. What would you say if you know if you, if there's some friends out there and you wanted to help them? What would you kind of do? What would be your approach? So I think in terms of social media, it's really important to set up boundaries. So I've got the screen time app on my phone that switches my social media off after three hours. I think, as Ben said, like who you follow is really important. And I think it's really crucial you follow people who are representative of the world we live in. So don't follow a certain appearance, follow a range of people. Um, If you want specific mental health advice, there are so many good therapists, psychologists, life coaches online giving free information on their page every day. And when you're you're looking at your feed and it's all about self-development and personal growth and those kind of things, it gives you the tools and sometimes it's coming on my knee on my newsfeed and simply saying seeing an infographic or a quote that is at the right moment that pulls me away from it and if you find yourself in that trap of cycling between apps which i think we've all done where like you're on your phone a little bit too long and you don't really know what you're looking for but you're going from like tiktok to twitter to instagram go do something else anything else go empty the dishwasher don't care like whatever you do phone down and like cut it in its like in its tracks like it's a habit and you just need to break that habit because you're looking for some usually you're looking for something to make you feel bad so mm-hmm. that's the social media side on the Excuse like that, if i can just interject just quickly on that we had a question from tia on facebook who says i feel like tiktok is incredibly toxic what are your opinions on this is tiktok yeah I'm, I'm not on tiktok anymore i am exactly that reason. <laughs> Um, I am. It's It's got um, elements of what I would call uh, the worst of Tumblr. And it's got elements of... Um, the problem is things go viral so quickly and it seems to be the, tra- the most traumatic it can be, the more um, attention it grabs. And so I wonder, especially for that individual, what it's telling that individual who's posting it, that you're only being listened to when you're talking about how awful your love life is or like whatever it is. And so, yeah, with TikTok, um, the, also the trapping in it of like watching it for hours is so much more addictive, this 15 second thing, Mm -hmm. which is why I think like the screen time thing really helps having one day a week where you turn your phone on airplane mode, having, I mean, for me, I try to, I, I've been doing this thing where I don't turn my phone off airplane mode until 11 o'clock in the morning. It means the first two hours of my work day, I am doing what I want to do. Because what you realize is everything on your phone is someone making a demand of you. Um, and the other thing I was just going to say in terms of mental health is like, what I've realized is the best way other people can help you is by asking for what you need. And I know that sounds simple, but it means me literally saying to my friends, and uh, my friends make a joke about it because they say this is my like go-to phrase. It's not meant to be a phrase. I just genuinely how I phrase it. But I go like, hey, do you have a moment? Or I go like, hey, um, are you are you free for five minutes? And they always know it's serious because I want to call them. And that's why I text them. But I think that's important because you don't know what's going on in that person's life. Mm-hmm. So I'm very careful about not emotionally dumping. So you check someone's like free, even if it's in person, you're going, hey, do you have five minutes? Hey, can I talk to you about something? Hey, can I vent to you for five minutes? And on the receiving end, a big skill I've learned is going, is holding space for a person, not trying to fix it, not trying to solve their problems, but just listening. Don't interrupt them, just let them talk. And when they stop talking, going like, oh, how do you feel about that? Or a a question that furthers the conversation. So, and it's this thing of, and even if you feel that urge to give advice, instead of giving the advice, just say, do you want me to listen or do you want some advice? Would you like a solution or would you just like to vent? Asking these questions clarifies it. And um, 
it's even something as simple as sometimes I go to my friends and go, I really need your attention right now. Like, mm-hmm. well, you know, when sometimes they're on their phone and you're talking about something that's important to you and you can still see they're still on your phone, it's slightly bugging you. Rather than like being passive aggressive about it, literally just being like, I really need your attention right now. Just ask for what you need. If people love you and they are the right people in your life, they will actually listen to you. They will drop their phone down and listen to you. If they're not the right people in your life, that's when you need to learn some boundaries, cut them out, and they're not to be trusted with vulnerable information. And so that's, again, about boundaries and um, not everyone deserves to know what your most vulnerable stuff. You only share your vulnerable things with people who've earned that trust. Because if you've shared something vulnerable, especially if it's the first time that you're opening up about your mental health and there is no track record of them being a good friend to you, that's when you can end up... I just don't want an experience where you open up for the first time and then someone shuts you down and you think that's going to be how everyone else in the world responds. Well, I was remember the first time that I went to see a counsellor, it was exactly that. It didn't, I didn't feel like I got the kind of what I needed back. So then I put it on the back burner for five years and I didn't do anything about mental health for the five years. So it is, and I mean, you know, that is probably just one counsellor. It could have been a multitude of reasons why it happened, but it, uh, listening to people is something that is so underrated isn't it Ben? Yeah I think so many people don't want to have this conversation because they feel like they've got to rescue them and to, to have to be the rescuer and I, I am so bad at this if someone comes to me with a problem I'm there like oh do this do this do this do this do this and I try and rescue I'm all about that I'm definitely a rescuer and actually at the end of the day the, the most important thing and I always say this to people, if someone you, someone you know is struggling and openly struggling and is obviously struggling with something, the best thing you can do to solve their solution and help them is not bombard them with solutions. It's just be a friend. Mm-hmm. Just be a friend. Just be who you are to them or a family member. Just be that person. They don't need you to come and counsel them. You don't need them to come up with solutions. Just listen and be their friend. And I think so many people are scared of, of approaching someone they know is struggling because they think, oh, I don't know how to, I don't know how to solve that. I don't know how to solve depression. I don't know how to solve that problem. Or their, their mum's died. I've got no idea how I can make that better for them. You don't have to rescue them. You don't have to rescue them. And so many lads I know have exactly that problem. They don't want to get into that point because they have no idea how to get them out. You don't have to get them out. Just listen. Just notice. I always think if you walked into a room and you saw your friend slumped over, their face was drooping, they couldn't speak. You'd be like, oh, mate, are you okay? Like we need to get an ambulance because that's quite serious. In the same way, if you see your mate struggling, that could be life threatening, right? It could be. Ask them if they're okay. Mm-hmm. Ask them if they're okay. You're not expected to cure their stroke, but you still ask if they're okay. You're not expected to cure their depression or cure what's going on in their life. You still ask if they're okay. Ask if they're okay. You don't have to rescue them. You just have to be a friend. I love that. And um, we've had another question here from uh, Emma Green, who says, um, just going back to the social media thing we were talking about and, you know, just being able to disengage with it. Emma says, what if your job is literally in social media? How can you protect yourself and look after yourself when it's your career? Well, it's my career, so you have no excuses. Sorry, but like this, if it's your career, you have to be even more boundary than the yeah. average person. And so... Yes, I have to be on my phone certain hours of day. If I told if uh, I told the average person on the street I go on, I'm on social media 7 hours a day, they're like that is awful, that's unhealthy. No, it's my job. So I'm doing Instagram stories, I'm I'm replying to comments, whatever it is. But there's a cut cut off time. For me at the moment it's the morning, so it's not on until 11 o'clock. Sometimes I turn it off at 6. You don't have to be there all day, every day. And sometimes it's about doing my my social media work in batches. So f- at the moment, I don't have to write a new Instagram post for maybe two weeks. I have things batched and prepared, so I don't need to be on it. And I knew it's because I have like two really busy weeks at the moment that I can't do both at the same time. So it's about time management, but also being honest with yourself. And I think regardless of if your job isn't in social media, a lot of the times we use work to feel needed and to feel important. And we're using that to fulfill a need that we're not getting elsewhere in our life. And if we were honest with ourselves, there are still elements you can control. Yes, you can't get get rid of it or get off it in the same way that people who aren't doing it their day-to-day life. 
but there are separation things you can do. And if it's your job, that block button exists for a reason. And I am liberal with the block button because I'm like, you know what? It really doesn't affect me if you don't follow me. It does affect me when you do follow me and send me shitty DMs. So I, if it's, I, I call my social media page my home. So if someone wouldn't speak to me that like that in my home, then you're not speaking to me like that on social media. And yeah. yes, I'm open to criticism. I'm not creating an echo chamber, but if your criticism comes with personal attack, it is not welcome and I don't need to listen to it. So it's also about knowing how you deserve to be treated online. And I think the problem with social media is like, it's not, it's not normal communication. So the usual rules of communication, like you wouldn't normally swear at a stranger in the street, don't really apply online. Actually yeah, they do and they can apply to you even if the rest of the world aren't following suit. And that might mean I have like people in the world who go, oh, she was so sensitive. She literally blocked me over one comment. Maybe I did. Maybe I am sensitive. Like, but that's how I stay safe and how I am healthy within my job. I love that. Um, and then, then just finally from you, then, if, if you could send one message to any young person out there that is finding life a little bit tough, which is probably perfectly normal at the minute, what would you say to them? Oh, wow. Well, firstly, I know people tell you you're meant to have a good time, but I don't expect you to. I certainly didn't. I dropped out of uni in January this year. I didn't expect to. Uh, and that wasn't very, that wasn't very easy. This whole year of university has been pretty awful. Um, and if we go back to what the title of this event is. These are the best years of your life. No, they're not. No, they're not. I'm hoping the next few years of my life are going to be much better. I can't lie. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you are out there struggling, know that there's no expectation for you to do anything other than what you're doing. Um, life has a funny way of working out if you just stick at it. Um, I love the phrase. I can't remember what it is. It's, um, you know, uh, oh, what? Oh, that's awful, isn't it? I'm so, I'm all about phrasing. I've just forgotten my phrase. <laughs> you um, put yourself down there in the last leg. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, no, what is it? That's no, going to bug me now. Tell you what, put on your Instagram later. And then I will, I'll have to. And I'll come and find the key phrase. If it's not easy, it's not done yet, something like that. Anyway, it's <laughs> that sort of idea, right? Okay, so, but, but also if, if life is hard at the moment, you don't have to do that alone. Please don't do that alone. If you're down... Tell someone, have that conversation. You know, we, me and my mates, we have that conversation all the time. We'll just talk very openly. And and I think we start normalise having conversations about mental health when someone asks you how you're doing. Don't just be like, oh, yeah, fine, mate. Actually be like, actually, yeah, you know what? My mental health took a hit yesterday. Let's start having those conversations. And please, if you're having a tough time at the moment, which I'm sure a lot of you are, um, yeah, feel 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 able to have that conversation um whether it's with a friend family member or you can always text 85258 shout crisis text line um there's loads of anonymous services online if you don't want to talk to someone you know um but it is important that we that we are open about how we're doing guys i feel like we could absolutely guess about this all night we long could do this all night <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure talking to you and it's and you know it's been really nice just talking to people about their experiences of the last year as well because it's, it's a boat that we've all been in so thank you very much for joining us tonight guys and uh, thank you for being, being so honest with us thank you to rachel pinkney uh, for producing and also to badger and coombs with the technical support this evening uh, don't forget we've got a week-long series of events focusing on mental health you can go to the media city uh, uk official facebook page for more information and very importantly just as ben was saying don't forget there's loads of online support out there for anyone who's struggling want to mention talk about it mate which is a free online service which is going to be um, available immediately after this the details will be on the facebook page straight after the events to get involved thank you very much again and look after yourselves we'll see you soon thanks lauren thanks everyone bye